Chapter One of A Coin of Edward the Seventh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcel D. Ward, TheSoulExpands.com. A Coin of Edward the Seventh by Fergus Hume, Chapter One. The Christmas Tree The two old ladies sat in the corner of the drawing room. The younger, a colonial cousin of the elder, was listening eagerly to gossip, which dealt with English society in general and Rickwell society in particular. They presumably assisted in the entertainment of the children already gathered tumultuously round the Christmas tree, provided by Mr. Morley. But Mrs. Perry's budget of scandal was too interesting to permit the relaxing of Mrs. McHale's attention. Ah, uh, yes, said Mrs. Perry, a hatchet-faced dame with a venomous tongue and a retentive memory. Morley's fond of children, although he has none of his own. But those three pretty little girls, said Mrs. McHale, who was fat, fair, and considerably over forty. Triplets, replied the other, sinking her voice. The only case of triplets I have met with, but not his children. No, Mrs. Morley was a widow with triplets and money. Morley married her for the last, and had to take the first, as part of the bargain. I don't deny but what he does his duty by the three. Mrs. McHale's keen gray eyes wander to the fat, rosy little man who laughingly struggled amidst a bevy of children, the triplets included. He seems fond of them, said she, nodding. Seems, emphasized Mrs. Perry shrewdly. Ha! I don't trust the man. If he were all he seems, would his wife's face wear that expression? No, don't tell me. Mrs. Morley was a tall, lean, serious woman, dressed in sober gray. She certainly looked careworn and appeared to participate in the festivities more as a duty than for the sake of amusement. He is said to be a good husband, observed Mrs. McHale doubtfully. Are you sure? I'm sure of nothing where men are concerned. I wouldn't trust one of them. Morley is attentive enough to his wife, and he adores the triplets, so he says. But I go by his eye. Orgy is written in that eye. It can pick out a pretty woman, my dear. Oh, his wife doesn't look sick with anxiety for nothing. At any rate, he doesn't seem attentive to that pretty girl over there, the one in black with the young man. Girl! She's twenty-five, if she's an hour. I believe she paints and puts belladonna in her eyes. I wouldn't have her for my governess. No, she's too artful, though I can't agree with you about her prettiness. Is she the governess? Mrs. Perry nodded, and the ribbons on her cap curl like Medusa's snakes. For six months Mrs. Morley has put up with her. She teaches the tricolor goodness knows what. The tricolor? So we call the triplets. Don't you see? One is dressed in red, another in white, and the third in blue? Morley's idea, I believe. As though a man had any right to interest himself in such things. We call them collectively the tricolor. And, and Denham is the governess. Pretty? No. Artful? Yes. See how she is trying to fascinate Ware? That handsome young man with the fair mustache and... The same, interrupted Mrs. Perry, too eager to blacken character to give her friend a chance of concluding her sentence. Giles Ware of Kingshart. The head of one of our oldest Essex families. He came into the estates two years ago and has settled down into a country squire after a wild life. But the old Adam, 
is in him, my dear. Look at his smile. And she doesn't seem to mind, brazen creature. And Mrs. Perry shuddered virtuously. The other lady thought that Ware had a most fascinating smile and was a remarkably handsome young man of the fair Saxon type. He certainly appeared to be much interested in the conversation of Miss Denham. But what young man could resist so beautiful a woman? For in spite of Mrs. Perry's disparagement, Anne was a splendidly handsome brunette. With a temper, added Mrs. McHale mentally, as she eyed the well-suited couple. Mrs. Perry's tongue still raged like a prairie fire. And she knows he's engaged, she snorted. Look at poor Daisy Kent, out in the cold, while that woman monopolizes Ware. Ugh! Is Miss Kent engaged to Mr. Ware? For three years they have been engaged. A family arrangement, I understand. The late Kent and the late Ware, explained Mrs. Perry, who always spoke thus politely of men, were the greatest of friends which I can well understand, as each was an idiot. However, Ware died first and left his estate to Giles. A few months later, Kent died and made Morley the guardian of his daughter Daisy, already contracted to be married to Giles. Does he love her? Oh, he's fond of her in a way, and he is anxious to obey the last wish of his father, but it seems to me that he is more in love with that black cat. Hush! You'll be heard. Mrs. Perry snorted. I hope so. And by the cat herself, she said grimly. I can't bear the woman. If I were Mrs. Morley, I'd have her out of the house in ten minutes. Turn her out in the snow to cool her hot blood. What right has she to attract wear and make him neglect that dear angel over there? See? Yonder is Daisy. There's a face. There's charm. There's hair. Finished Mrs. Perry, quite unconscious that she was using the latest London slang. I call her a lovely creature. Mrs. McHale did not agree with her venomous cousin. Daisy was a washed-out blonde with large blue eyes and a slack mouth. Under a hot July sky and with a flush of color, she would have indeed been pretty but the cold of winter and the neglect of Giles Ware shriveled her up. In spite of the warmth of the room, the gaiety of the scene, she looked pinched and older than her years. But there was some sort of character in her face, for Mrs. McHale caught her directing a glance full of hatred at the governess. In spite of her ethereal prettiness, Daisy Kent was a good hater. Mrs. McHale felt sure of that. And she is much more of the cat type than the other one is, thought the observant lady, too wise to speak openly. However, Mrs. Perry still continued to destroy a character every time she opened her mouth. She called the rector a papist, hinted that the doctor's wife was no better than she should be, announced that Morley owed money to his tradesmen, that he had squandered his wife's fortune, and finally wound up saying that he would spend Daisy Kent's money when he got it. If it ever does come to her, finished the amiable person. Did her father leave her money? asked Mrs. McHale. He, snapped the other. My dear, he was as poor as a church mouse and left Daisy only a hundred a year to live on. That is the one decent thing about Morley. He did take Daisy in, and he does treat her well, although, to be sure, she is a pretty girl, and, as I say, he has an eye. Then where does the fortune come from? Kent was a half-brother who went out to America, and it is rumored that he made a fortune, which he intends to leave to his niece, that's Daisy, but I don't know all the details of this added Mrs. Perry, rubbing her beaky nose angrily. I must find out somehow, but here, my dear, those children are stripping the tree. Let us assist. We must give pleasure to the little ones. I have had six of my own, 
all married, ended the good lady irrelevantly. She might have added that her four sons and two daughters kept a safe distance from their respected parent. On occasions, she did pay a visit to one or the other, and usually created a disturbance. Yet this spiteful, mischief-making woman read her Bible, thought herself a Christian, and judged others as harshly as she judged herself leniently. Mrs. McHale was stopping with her, therefore could not tell her what she thought of her behavior, but she privately determined to cut short her visit and get away from this disagreeable old creature. In the meantime, Mrs. Perry, smiling like the wicked fairy godmother with many teeth, advanced to meddle with the Christmas tree and set the children by the ears. She was a perfect auntie. Giles said as much to Miss Denham, and she nervously agreed with him, as though fearful lest her assent should reach the ears of Mrs. Perry. She has no love for me, whispered Anne. I think you had better talk to Daisy, Mr. Ware. I prefer to talk to you, said Giles coolly. Daisy is like her name, a sweet little English meadow flower, and I love her very dearly but she has never been out of England, and sometimes we are at a loss what to talk about. Now you. I am a gypsy, interrupted Anne, lest he should say something too complimentary. A uh, she Ulysses, who has traveled far and wide. In spite of your preference for my conversation, I wish I were Daisy. Do you? asked Ware eagerly. Why? Anne flushed and threw back her head proudly. She could not altogether misunderstand his meaning or the expression of his eyes, but she strove to turn the conversation with a laugh. You ask too many questions, Mr. Ware, she said coldly. I think Daisy is one of the sweetest girls, and I envy her. To have a happy home, a kind guardian as Mr. Morley is, and a... Uh, she was about to mention Giles, but prudently suppressed the remark. Go on, he said quietly, folding his arms. She shook her head and bit her lip. You keep me from my work. I must attend to my duties. A poor governess, you know. With a laugh, she joined the band of children who were besieging Morley. Giles remained where he was, his eyes fixed moodily on the ground. For more than five months he had fought against an ever-growing passion for the governess. He knew that he was in honor bound to marry Daisy, and that she loved him dearly, yet his heart was with Anne Denham. Her beauty, her brilliant conversation, her charm of manner, all appealed to him strongly. And he had a shrewd suspicion that she was not altogether indifferent to him, although she loyally strove to hide her true feelings. Whenever he became tender, she ruthlessly laughed at him. She talked constantly of Daisy and of her many charms, and on every occasion strove to throw her into the company of Giles. She managed to do so on this occasion, for Giles heard a rather pettish voice at his elbow and looked down to behold a flushed face. Daisy was angry and looked the prettier for her anger. You have scarcely spoken to me all night, she said, taking his arm. I do think you are unkind. My dear, you have been so busy with the children, and indeed, he added with a grave smile, you are scarcely more than a child yourself, Daisy. I am woman enough to feel neglect. I apologize. On my knees, dearest. Oh, it's easy saying so, pouted Daisy. But you know, and what about Miss Denham? Asked Giles, outwardly calm. You like her. She is a very charming woman, but you ought to be my wife. Jealous little girl, can I not be ordinarily civil to Miss Denham without you getting angry? You need not be so very civil. I won't speak to her at all, if you like, replied Ware, with a fine assumption of carelessness. Oh, if you only wouldn't, Daisy stopped, then continued passionately. 
I wish she would go away. I don't like her. She is fond of you, Daisy. Yes, and a cat is fond of a mouse. Mrs. Perry says, don't quote that odious woman, child, interrupted Ware sharply. She has a bad word for everyone. Well, she doesn't like Anne. Does she like anyone? asked Giles coolly. Come, Daisy, don't wrinkle your face, and I'll take you out for a drive in my motor car in a few days. Tomorrow, tomorrow, cried Daisy, her face wreathed in smiles. No, I daren't do that on Christmas Day. What would the rector say? As the lord of the manor, I must set an example. On Boxing Day, if you like. We will go along? Certainly. Who do you expect me to ask other than you? Anne, said Daisy spitefully, and before he could reply, she also moved away to join the children. Giles winced. He felt that he was in the wrong and had given his little sweetheart some occasion for jealousy. He resolved to mend his ways and shun the too fascinating society of the enchantress. Shaking off his moody feeling, he came forward to assist Morley. The host was a little man, and could not reach the gifts that hung on the topmost boughs of the tree. Giles, being tall and having a long reach of arm, came to his aid. That's right, that's right, gasped Morley, his round face red, and shining with his exertions. The best gifts are up here. As the best gifts of man are from heaven, put in Mrs. Perry, with her usual tact. Morley laughed. Quite so, quite so, he said, careful, as was everyone else, not to offend the lady. But on this occasion we can obtain the best gifts. I and Ware and Mrs. Morley have contributed to the tree. The children have their presents now for the presence of the grown-ups. By this time, the children were gorged with food and distracted by many presents. They were seated everywhere, many on the floor, and the room was a chaos of dolls, trumpets, toy horses, drums. The chatter of the children and the noise of the instruments was fearful, but Morley seemed to enjoy the riot, and even his wife's grave face relaxed when she saw her three precious jewels rosy with pleasure. She drew Anne's attention to them, and the governess smiled sympathetically. Miss Denham was popular with everyone save Daisy in that happy home. Meantime, Giles handed down the presents. Mrs. Morley received a chain purse from her affectionate husband. Mrs. Perry a silver cream jug, which she immediately priced as cheap. Mrs. McKay laughed delightedly over a cigarette case, which she admitted revealed her favorite vice and the rector was made happy with a motor bicycle. It has been taken to your house this evening, explained Morley. We couldn't put that on the tree. Ha ha. A muff chain for Daisy, said Giles, presenting her with the packet. And I hope you will like it, dear. Did you buy it? She asked, sparkling and palpitating. Of course. I bought presents both for you and Miss Denham. Here is yours. He added, turning to the governess, who grew rosy. A very simple bangle. I wish it were more worthy of your acceptance, and he handed it with a bow. Daisy, her heart filled with jealousy, glided away. Giles saw her face, guessed her feeling, and followed. In a corner he caught her and placed something on her finger. Our engagement ring, he whispered. And Daisy once more smiled. Her lover smiled also, but his heart was heavy. End of chapter one. Recording by Marcel D. Ward, thesoulexpands.com. Chapter Two of A Coin of Edward the Seventh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcel D. Ward, thesoulexpands.com. A Coin of Edward the Seventh by Fergus Hume, Chapter Two. An Anonymous Letter. After the ride of the evening came the silence of the night. The children departed, 
amidst the stormy laughter of Morley, and it was Anne's task to see that the triplets were put comfortably to bed. She sat in the nursery and watched the washing and undressing and hair curling, and listened to their joyous chatter about the wonderful presents and the wonderful pleasures of that day. Afterwards, when they were safely tucked away, she went down to supper and received the compliments of Morley on her capability in entertaining children. Mrs. Morley also, and in a more genuine way, added her quota of praise. "'You are my right hand, Miss Denham,' she said, with a smile in her weary blue eyes. "'I don't know what I shall do without you.' "'Oh, Miss Denham is not going,' said the master of the house. "'Who knows?' smiled Anne. "'I have always been a wanderer, and it may be that I shall be called away suddenly.' It was on the tip of Morley's tongue to ask by whom, but the hardening of Anne's face and the flash of her dark eyes made him change his mind. All the same, he concluded that there was someone by whom she might be summoned and guessed also that the obeying of the call would come as an unwilling duty. Mrs. Morley saw nothing of this. She had not much brain power, and what she had was devoted to considerations dealing with the passing hour. At the present moment, she could only think that it was time for supper, and that all present were hungry and tired. Hungry Anne certainly was not, but she confessed to feeling weary. Making some excuse, she retired to her room, but not to sleep. When the door was locked, she put on her dressing gown, shook down her long black hair, and sat by the fire. Her thoughts were not pleasant. Filled with shame at the knowledge of his treachery towards the woman he was engaged to marry, and Giles had kept close to Daisy's side during supper and afterwards. He strove to interest himself in her somewhat childish chatter, and made her so happy by his mere presence that her face was shining with smiles. Transfigured by love and by gratified vanity, Daisy looked really pretty, and in her heart was scornful of poor Anne, thus left out in the cold. She concluded that Giles loved her best after all, and did not see how he every now and then stealthily glanced at the governess wearily striving to interest herself in the breezy conversation of Morley or the domestic chatter of his wife. In her heart, Anne had felt a pang at this desertion. Although she knew that it was perfectly justifiable and unable to bear the sight of Daisy's brilliant face, she retired thus early. She loved Giles. It was no use blinking the fact. She loved him with every fiber of her nature and with a passion far stronger than could be felt for him by the golden-haired doll with the shallow eyes. For Giles, she would have lost the world, but she would not have him lose his for her. And, after all, she had no right to creep like a serpent into the Eden of silly, prattling Daisy. In her own puny way, the child, for she was little else, adored Giles, and as he was her affianced lover, it would be base to come between her and her God. But Anne knew in her heart that Giles loved her best. If she did but lift her hand, he would leave all and follow her to the world's end. But lift her hand she would not. It would be too cruel to break the butterfly daisy on such a painful wheel. Anne loved sufficiently to be large and generous in her nature, and therefore broke her own heart to spare the breaking of another woman's. Certainly Giles was as unhappy as she was. That was patent in his looks and bearing, but he had forged his own chains, and could not break them without dishonor. And come what may, Giles would always love her best. Anne's meditations were disturbed by a knock at the door. Glancing at the clock, she saw it was close 
on midnight and wondering who wished to see her at so late an hour she opened the door daisy in a blue dressing gown with her golden hair loose and her face flushed entered the room she skipped towards anne with a happy laugh and threw her arms round her neck i could not sleep without telling you how happy i am she said and with a look of triumph displayed the ring Anne's heart beat violently at this visible sign of the barrier between her and Giles. However, she was too clever a woman to betray her emotion and examine the ring with a forced smile. Diamonds for your eyes, rubies for your lips, she said softly. A very pretty fancy. Daisy was annoyed. She would rather that Anne had betrayed herself by some rude speech, or at least by discomposed manner to make her heart ache daisy had come and from all she could see she had not accomplished her aim however she still tried to wring some sign of emotion from the expression or lips of the calm governess giles promised me a ring over and over again she said her eyes fixed on anne we have been engaged for over six months he asked me just before you came, although it was always an understood thing. His father and mine arranged the engagement, you know. I didn't like the idea at first as I wanted to make my own choice. Every girl should, I think. Don't you? Certainly, Anne forced herself to say. But you love Mr. Ware. Daisy nodded. Very, very much, she assented emphatically. I must have loved him without knowing it, but I was only certain when he asked me to marry him. How lucky it is he has to make me his wife, she sighed. If he were not bound, here she stopped suddenly and looked into the other woman's eyes. What nonsense! said Anne good-humouredly, and more composed than ever. Mr. Ware loves you dearly. You are the one woman he would choose for his wife. There is no compulsion about his choice, my dear. Do you really think so? demanded the girl feverishly. I thought it was the ring, you know. What do you mean, Daisy? He never would give me the ring although I said it was ridiculous for a girl to be engaged without one. He always made some excuse, and only tonight. But I have him safe now, she added, with a fierce abruptness, and I'll keep him. Nobody wants to take him from you, dear. Do you really think so? said Miss Kent again. Then why did he delay giving me the ring? Anne knew well enough. After her first three meetings with Giles, she had seen the love light in his eyes, and his reluctance to bind himself irrevocably with the ring was due to a hope that something might happen to permit his choosing for himself. But nothing had happened. The age of miracles being passed, and the vow to his dead father bound him. Therefore, on this very night, he had locked his shackles, and had thrown away the key, and had made it plain to him that she could not, nor would she, help him to play a dishonorable part. He had accepted his destiny, and now Daisy asked why he had not accepted it before, and made a feeble excuse, the best she could think of. Perhaps he did not see a ring pretty enough, she said. It might be that replied Daisy reflectively. Giles has such good taste. You did not show me what he gave you tonight. Miss Denham would rather not have shown it. But she had no excuse to refuse a sight of the gift. Without a word, she slipped the bangle from her wrist. Daisy's jealous eyes noted that she had kept it on till now, and handed it to the girl. 
Oh, how sweet and pretty, she cried, with artificial cordiality. Just a ring of gold with a coin attached. May I look? And without waiting for permission, she ran to the lamp. The coin was a half-sovereign of Edward the Seventh, with three stones, a diamond, an amethyst, and a pearl, set in a triangle. A thin ring of gold attached it to the bangle. Daisy was not ill-pleased that the gift was so simple. Her engagement ring was much more costly. It's a cheap thing, she said contemptuously. The coin is quite common. It will be rare some day, said Anne, slipping the bangle on her wrist. The name of the king is spelt on this one, E-D-W-A-R-D-U-S, whereas in the Latin it should be E-D-V-A-R-D-U-S. I believe the issue is to be called in. Consequently, coins of this sort will be rare some day. It was kind of Mr. Ware to give it to me. Daisy paid no attention to this explanation. An amethyst, a diamond, and a pearl, she said. Why did he have those three stones set in the half-sovereign? Anne turned away her face, for it was burning red. She knew very well what the stones signified, but she was not going to tell this jealous creature. Daisy's wits, however, were made keen by her secret anger and after a few moments of thought she jumped up, clapping her hands. I see it. The initials of your name. Amethyst stands for Anne, and Diamond for Denham. It might be so, replied Miss Denham coldly. It is so, said Daisy, her small face growing white and pinched. But what does the pearl mean? Ah, that you are a pearl. Nonsense, Daisy. Go you to bed, and don't imagine things. It is not imagination, cried the girl shrilly. And you know that well, Anne. What right have you to come and steal Giles from me? He is yours, said Anne sharply. The ring? Oh, yes, the ring. I have his promise to marry me, but you have his heart. Don't I know? Give me that bangle. And she stretched out her hand with a clutching gesture. No, said Anne sternly. I shall keep my present. Go to bed. You are overtired. Tomorrow you will be wiser. I am wise now. Too wise. You have made Giles love you. I have not. I swear I have not, said Anne beginning to lose her composure. You have, and you love him. I see it in your face. Who are you to come into my life and spoil it? I am a governess. That is all you need to know. You look like a governess, said Daisy insultingly. I believe you are a bad woman and came here to steal Giles from me. Daisy! Anne rose to her feet and walked towards the door. I have had quite enough of your hysterical nonsense. If you came here to insult me in this way, it is time you went. Mr. Ware and I were complete strangers to one another when I came here. Strangers? And what are you now? Friends. Nothing more, nothing less. So you say. And I dare say Giles would say, the same thing did I ask him. Anne's face grew white and set. She seized the foolish, hysterical little creature by the wrist and shook her. I'll tell you one thing, she said softly, and her threat was the more terrible for the softness. I have black blood in my veins, for I was born at Martinique. And if you talk to Giles about me, I'll, I'll kill you. Go and pray to God that you may be rid of this foolishness. Daisy, wide-eyed, pallid, and thoroughly frightened, fled whimpering 
and sought refuge in her own room. Anne closed the door and locked it, so as to prevent a repetition of this unpleasant visit. Then she went to open the window, for the air of the room seemed tainted by the presence of Daisy. Flinging wide the casement, Anne leaned out into the bitter air and looked at the wonderful white snow world glittering in the thin, chill moonlight. She drew several long breaths and became more composed. Sufficient, indeed, to wonder why she had behaved in so melodramatic a fashion. It was not her custom to so far break through the conventions of civilization. But the insults of Daisy had stirred in her that wild negro blood to which she had referred. That this girl, who had all she grudged, heard the simple Christmas present made and furious. Yet in spite of her righteous anger, she could not help feeling sorry for Daisy. And, after all, the girl's jealousy had some foundation in truth. Anne had given her no cause, but she could not deny that she loved Giles and that he loved her. To end an impossible situation, there was nothing for it but flight. Next day, Anne quite determined to give Mrs. Morley notice, but when she found that Daisy said nothing about her visit, she decided to remain silent. Unless the girl made herself impossible, Anne did not see why she should turn out of a good situation where she was earning excellent wages. Daisy avoided her and was coldly polite on such occasions as they had to speak. Seeing this, Anne forbore to force her company upon the unhappy girl and attended to her duties. These were sufficiently pleasant, for the three children adored her. They were not clever, but extremely pretty and gentle in their manners. Mrs. Morley often came to sit and sew in the schoolroom while Anne taught. She was fond of the quiet, calm governess, and prattled to her just as though she were a child herself of the perfections of Mr. Morley and her unhappy early life. For the sake of the children, she forbore to mention the name of their father, who, from her account, had been a sad rascal. Giles came sometimes to dine, but attended chiefly to Daisy. Anne was content that this should be so, and her rival made the most of the small triumph. Indeed, so attentive was Giles that Daisy came to believe she had been wrong in suspecting he loved the governess. She made no further reference to Anne, but when Miss Denham was present, narrowly watched her attitude and that of Ware. Needless to say, she saw nothing to awaken her suspicions, for both Giles and Anne were most careful to hide their real feelings. So far, the situation was endurable, but it could not continue indefinitely, and made up her mind to leave. On the day before New Year, she was wondering what excuse she could make to get away, when an accident happened which set her duty plainly before her and did away with all necessity for an excuse. It occurred at breakfast. The little man was fond of his meals and enjoyed his breakfast more than any other. He had the most wonderful arrangement for keeping the dishes hot, a rather needless proceeding, as he was invariably punctual. So were Mrs. Morley and Anne, for breakfast being at nine o'clock, they had no excuse for being late. Nevertheless, Daisy rarely contrived to be in time, and Morley was much vexed by her persistent unpunctuality. On this occasion, she arrived late as usual, but more cheerful. She ever greeted Anne with a certain amount of politeness. There is a letter for you, said Morley, but if you will take my advice, you will leave it until breakfast is over. I never read mine until after a meal. Bad news is so apt to spoil one's appetite. How do you know the news will be bad? Asked Daisy. Most news is, 
replied Morley, with a shade on his usually merry face. Debts, duns, and difficulties. And he looked ruefully at the pile of letters by his plate. I haven't examined my correspondence yet. Anne said nothing, as she was thinking of what arrangement she could make to get away. Suddenly, she and the others were startled by a cry from Daisy. The girl had opened the letter and was staring at it with a pale face. Anne half rose from her seat, but Mrs. Morley anticipated her, and ran round to put her hand on the girl's shoulder. Daisy? What is the matter? The... the... letter gasped Daisy, with chattering teeth. Then she cast a look full of terror at the astonished Anne. She will kill me, cried the girl, and fell off the chair in a faint. Morley hastily snatched up the letter. It was unsigned, and apparently written in an uneducated hand on common paper. He read it out hurriedly, while Anne and Mrs. Morley stood amazed to hear its contents. Honored Miss, read Morley slowly. This is from a well-wisher to say that you must not trust the governess who will kill you because of G.W. and the Scarlet Cross. Anne uttered a cry and sank back into her chair, white as the snow out of doors. The Scarlet Cross, she murmured. Again, the Scarlet Cross. End of chapter 2 Recording by Marcel D. Ward, thesoulexpands.com. Chapter 3 of A Coin of Edward the Seventh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcel D. Ward, thesoulexpands.com. A Coin of Edward the Seventh by Fergus Hume. Chapter Three A Mysterious Visitor. Later in the day, Mr. Morley called the three women into his library to have a discussion regarding the strange letter and its stranger accusation. Daisy had recovered from her faint, but was still pale, and obviously afraid of Anne. The governess appeared perfectly composed, but her white face was as hard as granite. Both Morley and his wife were much disturbed, as was natural, especially as, at the moment, Anne had refused any explanation. Now Morley was bent, and forcing her to speak out, and set Daisy's mind at rest. The state of the girl was pitiable. The library was a large square apartment with three French windows opening onto a terrace, when steps led down to a garden laid out in the stiff Dutch style. The room was somber with oak and heavy red velvet hangings, but rendered more cheerful by books, photographs, and pictures. Morley was fond of reading, and during his ten years' residence at the Elms had accumulated a large number of volumes. Between the bookcases were trophies of arms, medieval weapons and armor, and barbaric spears from Africa and the South Seas, intermixed with bows and clubs. The floor was of polished oak, with here and there a brilliantly colored Persian praying mat. The furniture was also of oak, and cushioned in red Morocco leather. Altogether, the library gave evidence of a refined taste, and was a cross between a monkish cell and a Sybarite's bower. Well, Miss Denham, said Morley, his merry face more than a trifle serious, what have you to say? There is nothing I can't say, replied Anne, with composure. The letter has nothing to do with me. My dear, put in Mrs. Morley. 
much distressed. You cannot take up this attitude. You know I am your friend, that I have always done my best for you, and for my sake, if not for Daisy's, you must explain. She won't, she won't, said Daisy, with an hysterical laugh. I would if I could, replied Anne, talking firmly, but the accusation is ridiculous. Why should I threaten Daisy? Because you love Giles, burst out the girl furiously. I do not love Mr. Ware. I said so the other night. And you said more than that. You said that you would kill me. Miss Denham, cried Morley, greatly shocked. What is this? A foolish word spoken in a foolish moment, said Anne, realizing that her position was becoming dangerous. I think so, too, said Mrs. Morley, defending her. It so happened, Miss Denham, that I overheard you make the speech to Daisy, and I told my husband about it the next morning. We decided to say nothing, thinking, as you say now, that it was simply a foolish speech. But this letter, she hesitated, then continued quickly, you must explain this letter. Anne thought for a moment. I can't explain it. Some enemy has written it. You know all about me, Mrs. Morley. You read my credentials. You inquired as to my former situations at the Governance Institute, where you engaged me. I have nothing to conceal in my life, and certainly I have no idea of harming Daisy. She came to my room and talked nonsense, which made me lose my temper. I said a foolish thing, I admit, but surely, knowing me as you do, you will acquit me of meaning anything by a few wild words uttered in a hurry and without thought. Why did you make use of such an expression? asked Morley. Because I was carried out of myself. I have a strain of negro blood in me, and at times say more than I mean. And your negro blood will make you kill me, cried Daisy, with an expression of terror. I am doomed, doomed. Don't be a fool, child, said Morley roughly. She is a trifle hysterical, explained Mrs. Morley, comforting the girl, who was sobbing violently. Mr. Morley, said Anne, rising, I don't know who wrote that letter or why it should have been written. Mr. Ware and I are friends, nothing more. I am not in love with him, nor is he in love with me. He has paid me no more attention than you have yourself. No, that is true enough, replied Morley. And as Giles is engaged to Daisy, I don't think he is the man to pay marked attention to another woman. Ah! Giles is all right, cried Daisy angrily, but she has tempted him. I deny that. You can deny what you like. It is true. You know it is true. Daisy, Daisy, said Morley persuasively, whereupon she turned on him like a little fury. Don't you defend her. You hate me as much as she does. You are a stop said Mrs. Morley, very pale. Hold your tongue, Daisy. My husband has treated you in the kindest manner. When your father died, you were left penniless. He took you in, and both he and I have treated you like our own child. Ungrateful girl, how can you speak so of those who have befriended you? I do. I shall. You all hate me, cried Daisy passionately. I never wanted your help. Giles would have married me long ago, but for Mr. Morley. I had no need to live on your charity. I have a hundred a year of my own. You brought that horrid woman down to steal Giles from me and take her away, Elizabeth, said Morley sharply. I'll go of my own accord, cried Daisy, retreating from Mrs. Morley, and I'll ask Giles to marry me at once. 
and take me from this horrid house. You are a cruel and a wicked man, Mr. Morley, and I hate you. I hate you. As for you, she turned in a vixenous manner on Anne. I hope you will be put in a jail some day. If I die, you will be hanged. Hanged! And with a snap of her foot, she dashed out of the room, banging the door. Hysteria, said Morley, wiping his face. He must have a doctor to see her. Miss Denham, said the wife, who was weeping at the cruel words of the girl, I ask you if Daisy has ever been treated harshly in my house. No, dear, Mrs. Morley. She has always received the greatest kindness both from you and your husband. She is not herself today. That cruel letter has upset her. In a short time, she will repent of her behavior. If she speaks like this to Mrs. Perry, what will happen? moaned the poor woman, wringing her hands. I'll have Mrs. Perry in court for libel if she says anything against us, said Morley fiercely. The girl is an hysterical idiot. To accuse her best friends of... Psh, it's not worth taking notice of. But this letter, Miss Denham... I know nothing about it, Mr. Morley. <laughs> I wonder if Daisy wrote it herself. Oliver! cried Mrs. Morley in amazement. Why not? Hysterical girls do queer things at times. I don't suppose Mrs. Perry wrote it. Old scandalmonger as she is, it is a strange letter. That Scarlet Cross, for instance. He fixed an inquiring eye on Anne. That is the one thing that makes me think Daisy did not write this letter. I fancy myself she might have done it in a moment of hysteria and out of hatred of me, but she could not know anything of the Scarlet Cross. No one in Rickwell could know of that. The letter was posted in London, in the general post office. But why should anyone write such a letter about me? said Anne, raising her hands to her forehead. And the Scarlet Cross. It is very strange. What is the Scarlet Cross? asked Mrs. Morley seriously. I know no more than you do, replied Anne earnestly. Save that my father sometimes received letters marked with a red cross, and on his watch chain wore a gold cross enameled with scarlet. Did your father know what the cross meant? asked Mrs. Morley. He must have known, but he never explained the matter to me. Perhaps if you ask him now to... My father is dead, she said in a low voice. He died a year ago in Italy. Then this mystery must remain a mystery, said Morley, with a shrug. Upon my word, I don't like all this. What is to be done? Put the letter into the hands of the police, suggested his wife. No, said Morley decisively. If the police heard the ravings of Daisy, heaven knows what they would think. But, my dear, it is ridiculous, said Mrs. Morley indignantly. We have always treated Daisy like one of ourselves. We have nothing to conceal. I am very angry at her. You should rather pity her, said Anne gently, for she is a prey to nerves. However, the best thing to be done is for me to leave this place. I shall go after the new year. I'm sure I don't know what the children will do without you, sighed the lady. They are so fond of you, and I never had any governess I got on better with. What will you do? Get a situation somewhere else, said Anne cheerfully. Abroad, if possible. But I have become a bugbear to Daisy, and it is best that I should go. I think so, too, Miss Denham. 
although both my wife and I are extremely sorry to lose you. You have been good friends to me, said Miss Denham simply, and my life here has been very pleasant. But it is best I should go, she repeated. And that letter, will you give me a copy, Mr. Morley? Certainly, but for what reason? I should like to find out who wrote it, and why it was written. It will be a difficult matter, but I am curious to know who this enemy of mine may be. Do you think it is an enemy? asked Mrs. Morley. Anne nodded. And an enemy that knows something about my father's life, she said emphatically. Else, why was mention made about the Scarlet Cross? But I'll learn the truth somehow, even if I have to employ a detective. You had much better leave the matter alone and get another situation, Miss Denham, said Morley sagely. We will probably hear no more of this, and when you go, the matter will fade from Daisy's mind. I'll send her away to the seaside for a week, and have the doctor to see her. Dr. Tate shall see her at once, said Mrs. Morley, with more vigor than was usual with her. But about your going, Miss Denham, I am truly sorry. You have been a good friend to me, and the dear children do you credit. I hope we shall see you again. When Daisy is married, not before, replied Anne firmly. But I will keep you advised of my address. After some further conversation on this point, the two women left the library. Daisy had shut herself in her room and thither went Mrs. Morley. She managed to soothe the girl, and gave her a sedative which calmed her nerves. When Daisy woke from sleep somewhere about five, she expressed herself sorry for her foolish chatter, but still entertained a dread and a hatred of Anne. The governess widely kept out of the way, and made her preparations for departure. As yet the children were not told that they were to lose her, Knowing what their lamentations would be like, Mrs. Morley wisely determined to postpone that information till the eleventh hour. There was to be a midnight service at the parish church in honor of the new year, and Anne determined to go. She wanted all the spiritual help possible in her present state of perplexity. The unhappy love that existed between her and Giles, the enmity of Daisy, the anxiety of the anonymous letter, these things worried her not a little. She received permission from Mrs. Morley to go to the midnight service. But be careful Daisy does not see you, said she anxiously. Is Daisy going also? Yes, Giles is coming to take her in his motor car. I hope she will say nothing to him about the letter. I'll see to that. She is much quieter and recognizes how foolish she has been. It will be all right. Morley was much upset by the state of affairs. But a few days before, and life had been all plain sailing. Now, there was little else but trouble and confusion. His ruddy face was pale. And he had a careworn expression. For the most part of the day, he remained in his library and saw no one. Towards the evening, he asked his wife not to bring the triplets to the library as usual, as he had to see someone on business. Who it was, he refused to say, and Mrs. Morley, having no curiosity, did not press the question. After dinner, the visitor arrived, a tall man muffled, in a great coat against the cold, and wearing a thick white scarf round his throat. He was shown into the library, and remained with Mr. Morley till after nine. About that time, Anne found occasion to go into the library in search of a book. She had not heard the prohibition of Morley, and did not hesitate to enter without knocking, supposing that no one was within. Meantime, Daisy dressed herself very carefully, in expectation of Ware's arrival. 
he was to take her for a ride in his motor before church. And then they were to go to the service together. There was plenty of snow on the ground, but the nights were always bright with moonlight. Daisy had a fancy for a moonlight ride, and Giles was willing to humor her. She expected him about ten, and descended shortly after nine to watch for him from the drawing-room window. Outside it was almost as light as day, and the white sheet of snow threw back a reflection of the moonlight. Daisy gazed eagerly down the avenue, where the leafless trees rocked in the cutting wind. Unexpectedly, she saw a tall man come round the corner of the house and walk swiftly down the avenue. She knew from Mrs. Morley that there was a visitor in the library, and wondered why he had elected to leave by the window, as he must have done to come round the house in this way. Being curious, she thought she would tell Mr. Morley of what she had seen, and went in search of him. At the door of the library, she had just laid her hand on the handle when it suddenly opened, and Anne came out. Her face was white and drawn. Her eyes were filled with fear, and she passed the astonished girl in a blind and stumbling fashion as though she did not see her. Daisy saw her feebly ascend the stairs, clutching the banisters. Wondering at this, Miss Kent entered the room. Morley was standing by the window, the middle window, looking out. It was open. He started and turned when Daisy entered, and she saw that he was perturbed also. What's the matter? she asked, coming forward. Nothing. What should be the matter? Morley spoke shortly and not in a pleasant tone. I thought that Anne... That Miss Denham looked ill, said Daisy. Don't you think you had better leave Miss Denham alone, Daisy, seeing the mischief you have caused? She has been weaving herself blind here. Well, that letter, oh, that letter is rubbish, interrupted Morley scornfully. Miss Denham is a simple, kind woman, and you should take no notice of anonymous correspondence. However, she is going away tomorrow. I have just paid her her wages. I am glad she is going, said Miss Kent doggedly. I am afraid of her. You think she is an angel. I don't. I don't think anything about her, but I do think you are a very hysterical girl and have caused a great deal of unnecessary trouble. Miss Denham is not in love with Ware and it is only your absurd jealousy that would accuse her of such a thing. Besides, this morning you behaved very badly to my wife and myself. You must go away for a time till we can get over your ungrateful words and conduct. I am very sorry, said Daisy humbly, but it was Anne who disturbed me in that letter. I was afraid. Then you admit that we have behaved well? You are my best friends. Thank you. And now, may I ask what you want? I came to tell you that I am going to church. I thought you were engaged. So I was. But my visitor is gone. I know. He went out by that window. I saw him going down the avenue. Who is he? A friend of mine. That is all you need to know. Did you think it was someone who had to do with the anonymous letter? No, no. Daisy seemed to be thoroughly ashamed of herself. But you must admit that the letter was strange. So strange that you had better say nothing about it. Don't mention it to Giles. Why not? Because I will find occasion to tell him myself. I at least will be able to explain without showing jealousy of poor Miss Denham. I won't say anything, replied Daisy, with a toss of her head. But you are all mad about Anne Denham. I don't believe she is a good woman. What is the matter with her now? She seems ill. For heaven's sake, don't ask me any further questions, said Morley irritably. 
what with your conduct of this morning and other things with which you have no concern, I am worried out of my life. Daisy took the hint and walked away. When she got outside the library, she came to the conclusion that Morley's visitor was a bailiff, and that was why he had been shown out by the window. Decidedly, her guardian was in a bad way, financially speaking. I shall marry Giles and get away from them all, said the grateful Daisy. They may be sold up, and my hundred a year will not keep me. What a mercy that Giles is so rich and loves me. No, he does not love me, she said vehemently to herself. Is that woman. But he is engaged to me, and I'll marry him if only to spite her. End of chapter 3 Recording by Marcel D. Ward, thesoulexpands.com Chapter 4 of A Coin of Edward the Seventh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcel D. Ward, TheSoulExpands.com. A Coin of Edward the Seventh by Fergus Hume. Chapter 4 The Churchyard. To Daisy, that drive in the motor car was like an exquisite dream. Her frivolous, shallow soul was awed by the vast white waste gleaming mysteriously in the moonlight as the car sped like a bird along the silent roads. There was not a cloud in the sky that shone like tempered steel, and amidst the frosty glitter of innumerable stars, the hard moon looked down on an enchanted world. With Giles's hand on the steering gear and Daisy beside him, wrapped in a buffalo rug, the machine flew over the pearly whiteness with the skimming swiftness of the magic horse. For the first time in her life, Daisy felt what flying was like and was content to be silent. Giles was well pleased that the great mother should steal her restless tongue for the moment. He was doing his duty and the will of his dead father. But his heart ached when he thought of the woman who should be by his side. Oh, that they too could undertake this magical journey together, silent and alone, in a silent and lonely world. He made no inquiries for Anne, and Daisy said nothing. Only when the car was humming along the homeward road to land them at the church did she open her mouth. The awe had worn off, and she babbled as if old in the very face of this white splendor. Anne's going away, she said abruptly. For the life of him, Giles could not help starting, but he managed to control his voice and speak carelessly. Ah, and how's that? he asked, busy with the wheel. She is going tomorrow. I suppose she is tired of the dull life here. I expect she is, replied Ware curtly. Are you sorry? Giles felt that she was pushing home the point, and that it behooved him to be extra careful. Yes, I am sorry, he said frankly. Miss Denham is a most interesting woman. Does that mean... It means nothing personal, Daisy, he broke in hastily, and then to change the subject. I hope you have enjoyed the ride. It is heavenly, Giles. How good of you to take me. My dear, I would do much more for you. When we are married, we must tour through England in this way. You and I together? How delightful. That is if you will not get tired of me. I am not likely to get tired of such a charming little woman. Then he proceeded to pay her compliments while his soul sickened at the avidity with which she swallowed them. He asked himself if it would not be better to put an end to this impossible state of things by telling her he was in love with Anne. But when he glanced at the little fragile figure beside him, 
and noted the delicacy and ethereal look in her face. He felt that it would be brutal to destroy her dream of happiness at the eleventh hour. Of himself, he tried to think not at all. So far as he could see, there was no happiness for him. He would have to go through life doing his duty. And then he put the thought of her from him with a shudder. What is the matter, Giles? Are you cold? asked Daisy. No, I expect a white hair is loping over my grave. Ugh, don't talk of graves, said Daisy with a nervous expression. Not a cheerful subject, I confess, said Giles, smiling. And here we are in the very thick of them, he added as the motor slowed down before the lich gate. Daisy looked at the innumerable tombstones which thrust themselves up through the snow and shivered. It's horrible, I think. Fancy being buried there. A beautiful spot in summer. And do you remember what Keats said about one being half in love with death to be buried in so sweet a place? Childs, she cried half hysterically. Don't talk like that. I may be dead and buried before you know that a tragedy has occurred. The cards say that I am to die young. Why, Daisy, what is the matter? She made no reply. A memory of the anonymous letter and its threat came home vividly to her, and she stepped inside the churchyard. Who knew but what, within a few days, she might be borne through that selfsame gate in her coffin? However, she had promised to say nothing about the letter, and fearful lest she should let slip some remark to arouse the suspicions of Giles, and she flew up the path. Already, the village folk were thronging to the midnight service. The bells were ringing with a musical chime, and the painted windows of the church glittered with rainbow hues. The organist was playing some Christmas carol, and the waves of sound rolled out solemnly on the still air. With salutation and curtsy, the villagers passed by the young squire. He waited to hand over his car to his servant, who came up at the moment, breathless with haste. Shall I wait for you, sir? No. Take the car to the inn, and make yourself comfortable. In an hour you can return. Nothing loth to get indoors and out of the bitter cold. The man drove the machine, humming like a top, down the road. The sky was now clouding over, and a wind was getting up. As Giles walked into the church, he thought there was every promise of a storm and wondered that it should labor up so rapidly, considering the previous calm of the night. However, he did not think further on the matter, but when within, looked around for Daisy. She was at the lower end of the church, staring not at the altar now glittering with candles, but at the figure of a woman some distance away who was kneeling with her face hidden in her hands. With a thrill, Giles recognized Anne, and fearful lest Daisy should be jealous did he remain in her vicinity. He made his way up to his own pew, which was in the Lady Chapel near the altar. Here he took his seat and strove to forget both the woman he loved and the woman he did not love. But it was difficult for him to render his mind a blank on this subject. The organ had been silent for some time, but it now recommenced its low, breathed music. Then the choir came slowly up the aisle, singing lustily a Christmas hymn. The vicar, severe and ascetic, followed, his eyes bent on the ground. When the service commenced, Giles tried to pay attention, but found it almost impossible to prevent his thoughts wandering towards the two women. He tried to see them, but pillars intervened, and he could not catch a glimpse of either, but his gaze fell on the tall figure of a man who was standing at the lower end of the church near the door. 
he was evidently a stranger for his eyes wandered inquisitively round the church in a heavy great coat and with a white scarf round his throat he was well protected against the cold giles noted his thin face his short red beard and his large black eyes his age was probably something over fifty and he looked ill worried and worn wondering who he was and what brought him to such an out-of-the-way place as rickwell at such a time giles settled himself comfortably in his seat to hear the sermon the vicar was not a particularly original preacher he discoursed platitudes about the coming year and the duties it entailed on his congregation owing to the length of the sermon and the lateness of the hour the people yawned and turned uneasily in their seats but no one ventured to leave the church although the sermon lasted close on an hour it seemed as though the preacher would never leave off insisting on the same things over and over again he repeated himself twice and thrice and interspersed his commonplace english with the lordly roll of biblical texts but for his position giles would have gone away it was long over the hour and he knew that his servant would be waiting in the cold when he stood up for the concluding hymn he craned his head around a pillar to see daisy she had vanished and he thought that like himself she had grown weary of the sermon but more fortunate than he she had been able to slip away anne's place he could not see and did not know whether she was absent or present giles wondered for one delicious moment if he could see her before she left the church daisy evidently wearied by the sermon had gone home there was no one to spy upon him and he might be able to have anne all to himself for a time he could then ask her why she was going and perhaps force her to confess that she loved him but even as he thought his conscience rebuked him for his treachery to daisy he fortified himself with good resolutions and resolved not to leave his seat until the congregation had dispersed thus he would not be tempted by the sight of anne the benediction was given the choir retired with the last musical amen and the worshippers departed but giles remained in his seat kneeling and with his face hidden he was praying for a strength he sorely needed to enable him to forget anne and to remain faithful to the woman whom his father had selected to be his wife not until the music of the organ ceased and the verger came to extinguish the altar candles did giles venture to go but by this time he thought anne would surely be well on her homeward way he would return to his own place as fast as his motor could take him and thus would avoid temptation at the present moment he could not trust to his emotions outside the expected storm had come on and snow was falling thickly from a black sky the light at the lich gate twinkled feebly and giles groped his way down the almost obliterated pathway quite alone for everyone else had departed he reached the gate quite expecting to find his motor but to his surprise it was not there not a soul was in sight and the snow was falling like meal giles fancied that his servant had dropped to sleep in the inn or had forgotten the appointed hour in his heart he could not blame the man for the weather was arctic in its severity however he determined to win his way to the inn and reprove him for his negligence stepping out of the gate he began to walk against the driving snow with bent head when he ran into the arms of a man who was running hard in the light of the lamp over the gate he recognized him as trim his servant beg pardon sir i could not get here any sooner the car the man stopped and stared round in amazement why sir where's the machine he asked with astonishment in your charge i suppose replied ware angrily why were you not here at the time i appointed 
I was begging your pardon, sir, said Trim hotly. But the lady told me you had gone to see Miss Kent back to the Elms and that you wanted to see me. I left the car here in charge of the lady and ran all the way to the Elms. But they tell me there that Miss Daisy hasn't arrived and that nothing has been seen of you, sir. Where I listened to this explanation with surprise. I sent no such message, he said. And this lady, who is she? Why, Miss Denham, sir. She said she would look after the car till I came back, and knowing as she was a friend of yours, sir, I thought it was all right. Trim stared all round him. She's taking the car away, I see, sir. The matter puzzled Giles. He could not understand why Anne should have behaved in such a manner, and still less could he understand why the car should have disappeared. He knew well that she could drive a motor, for he had taught her himself. But that she should thus take possession of his property and get rid of his man in so sly a way perplexed and annoyed him. He and Trim stood amidst the falling snow, staring at one another, almost too surprised to speak. Suddenly they heard a loud cry of fear, and a moment afterward an urchin, one of the choir lads, came tearing down the path as though pursued by a legion of fiends. Giles caught him by the collar as he ran panting and white-faced past him. "'What's the matter?' he asked harshly. "'Why did you cry out like that? Where are you going?' "'To mother. Oh, let me go,' wailed the lad. I see her lying on the grave. I'm frightened. Mother, mother. Saw who lying on the grave? I don't know. A lady. Her face is down in the snow and she is bleeding. I dropped the lantern mother gave me and scudded, sir. Do let me go. I never did it. Did what? Giles, in his nervous agitation, shook the boy. Killed her. I didn't. She's lying on Mr. Kent's grave. And I don't know who she is. He gave another cry for his mother and tried to get away, but Giles, followed by Trim, led him up the path. Take me to the grave, he said in a low voice. I won't, yelped the lad, and tearing his jacket in his eagerness to escape, he scampered past Trim and out of the gate like a frightened hare. Giles stopped for a moment to wipe his perspiring forehead and pass his tongue over his dry lips. Then he made a sign to Trim to follow and walked rapidly in the direction of Mr. Kent's grave. He dreaded what he should find there, and his heart beat like a sledgehammer. The grave was at the back of the church, and the choir boy had evidently passed it when trying to take a shortcut to his mother's cottage over the hedge. The snow was falling so thickly, and the night was so dark, that Giles wondered how the lad could have seen anyone on the grave. Then he remembered that the lad had spoken of a lantern. During a lull in the wind, he lighted a match, and by the blue glare, he saw the lantern almost at his feet, where the boy had dropped it in his precipitate flight. Hastily picking this up, he lighted the candle with shaking fingers and closed the glass. A moment later, and he was striding towards the grave with the lantern casting a large circle of light before him. In the ring of that pale illumination, he saw the tall tombstone, and beneath it the figure of a woman lying face downward on the snow. Trim gave an exclamation of astonishment, but Giles set his mouth and suppressed all signs of emotion. He wondered if the figure was that of Anne or of Daisy, and whether the woman, whomsoever she was, was dead or alive. Suddenly, he started back with horror. From a wound under the left shoulder blade, a crimson stream had welled forth, and the snow was stained with a brilliant red. The staring eyes of the groom looked over his shoulder as he turned the body face upwards. Then Giles uttered a cry. Here was Daisy Kent lying dead, murdered on her father's grave. End of chapter 4 Recording by Marcel D. Ward, thesoulexpands.com
Chapter Six of A Coin of Edward the Seventh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Coin of Edward the Seventh by Fergus Hume. Chapter Five. Afterwards. Never before had any event created such a sensation in the village of Rickwell. From the choir boy and his mother, the news quickly spread also giles had to call in the aid of the rector to have the body of the unfortunate girl carried to the elms in a short time the churchyard was filled with wondering people and quite a cortege escorted the corpse it was like the rehearsal of a funeral procession mrs morley had gone to bed thinking the two girls might be reconciled in church and come home together her husband not so sanguine had remained in the library till after midnight ready to play the part of peacemaker should any fracas occur he appeared in the hall when poor daisy was carried through the door and stared in surprise at the spectacle great heavens he cried coming forward his ruddy face pale with sudden emotion what is all this giles took upon himself the office of spokesman which the rector remembering that he had been engaged to the deceased tacitly delegated to him it's poor daisy he said hoarsely she has been murdered no don't say murdered yes we found her lying on her father's grave dead a knife thrust under the left shoulder blade she must have died almost instantaneously dead muttered morley ghastly white and he approached to take the handkerchief from the dead face dead he repeated replacing it then he looked at the haggard face of ware at the silent group of men and the startled women standing in the doorway where the rector was keeping them back where is her murderess he asked sharply murderess repeated giles angrily what do you mean mean why that miss denham has done this and you are mad to say such a thing i'll tax her with it to her face where is she not at home for i have been waiting to see her she's run away on mr ware's motor-car volunteered trim only to be clutched violently by his master don't say that you fool you can't be sure of that mr morley he added turning to the scared man make no remark about this until we can have a quiet talk about it but i say you can say it to the police officer in the morning she'll have escaped by that time whispered trim to his master giles saw the danger of anne supposing her to be guilty as the groom thought her and made up his mind at once go home trim and saddle a couple of horses we'll follow the track of the car and when we find it you'll never find it put in morley who had been listening with all his ears the falling snow must have obliterated any wheel marks by this time when did this occur i don't know replied giles coldly and instead of chattering there you had better have the the he stammered the body taken into some room and attended to poor daisy he sighed what an end to your bright young life here mr drake the rector thought it necessary to assert himself and waved aside the throng all you men and women go to your homes he said nothing can be done to-night and the car might be followed said a voice and the car will be followed said giles pushing his way to the door come trim we'll ride at once did no one see the car pass out of the village no one had seen it as most of the villagers had been inside the church and the rest in their homes there was some talk and suggestions but ware with a nod to morley took a hasty departure and disappeared into the stormy night he might track the car said the rector he won't replied morley bitterly he'll lead trim on a wrong scent he liked miss denham too well to let her drop into the hands of the police then you really think she did it asked drake horrified i am perfectly certain was the reply come into the library and i'll show you what evidence i have meantime the hall was cleared of the eager listeners and all present went to their homes less to sleep than to argue as to the guilt or innocence of anne the body of the girl was taken to her bedroom and poor scared mrs morley roused from her bed to face this tragedy did all that was needful assisted by two old women who remained behind to offer their services this was all that could be done till dawn and mrs morley thinking of the dead daisy and the missing anne wept till the first streaks of daylight as yet 
her limited understanding could not grasp the horror of the thing morley conducted mr drake to the library he related how his wife had heard anne threaten to kill daisy produced the anonymous letter detailed daisy's accusation that the governess was in love with ware and finally pointed out the damning fact of the flight the rector was quite convinced by this reasoning that anne was guilty and now i come to think of it he said stroking his shaven chin miss kent was in church yes so was miss denham and i don't think they sat together as they were on the worst possible terms did you see daisy drake nodded she went out when i was half-way through my sermon i remember that i felt a little annoyed that she should leave when i was doing my best to inculcate good habits for the year in my congregation she must have gone to pray at her father's grave and there drake stopped with sudden terror in his eyes and there miss denham stabbed her ware said the wound was beneath the left shoulder blade that looks as though daisy was struck from behind i can see it all cried morley with a shudder the poor child praying by her father's grave and the stealthy approach of that woman armed with a ah interposed drake there you are we have not yet found the weapon and after all morley the evidence is purely circumstantial we do not know for certain that miss denham is the guilty person why did she fly then demanded morley fiercely if she were innocent if she had not left the church until the others did she would have returned and now been in bed but from what trim says she fled on ware's motor-car humph she can't get far on that such a night too and the rector walked to the window to watch the still falling snow morley shook his head miss denham knows the country for miles and miles and ware taught her how to drive the motor i shouldn't be surprised if she got away after all in spite of the weather drake looked uneasy and placed himself before the fire with a shiver he rather admired miss denham and could not yet bring himself to believe that she was guilty even if she were he cherished a secret hope that she might escape the police it was terrible to think that one woman should be dead but it was more awful to look forward to the trial condemnation and hanging of the other i blame ware a good deal for this continued morley gloomily he openly admired miss denham and encouraged her to flirt with him a rash thing to do to one who has negro blood in her veins i expect fashion carried her beyond herself how do you know she has negro blood she said so herself did you know that when you engaged her i never engaged her at all drake my wife did i must say that miss denham's credentials were good she had been governess in an italian family and ha he suddenly stopped and started up in italy she might have procured a stiletto from the nature of the wound which is small and deep i should think it was inflicted with such a weapon how do you know that the wound is small and deep my wife told me when she came to the door that time you did not hear her she says the wound is quite small in that case it must be deep or the death would not have occurred so suddenly drake shook his head we don't know that it did occur suddenly morley contradicted this angrily if daisy had not died at once she would have had time to shriek and the cry would have been heard in the church i doubt it the people were deeply interested in my sermon the other man shrugged his shoulders it was scarcely worth while arguing this point with the rector he relapsed into a brown study until roused to reply to a question asked by his guest have you ever seen a stiletto asked drake i have one here replied morley running his eye along the wall one that i got in italy myself it was said to have belonged to lucretia borgia i wonder where it is rather difficult to discover it amidst all these weapons mr morley good heavens what is the matter he might well ask his host was clutching his arm in a vice-like hold and was pointing to a certain part of the wall whereon hung a pair of ancient pistols a crusader's shield and an old helmet the stiletto was there it is gone gasped morley impossible who can have taken it miss denham miss denham oh and you believe her to be innocent cried the other she came into this very room at nine o'clock or a little after i was outside on the terrace seeing a visitor off she was alone in the room for a time she must have taken the weapon no no 
why should she have because she intended to murder my poor daisy it was all arranged in her black heart drake he added solemnly i have done my best to believe that woman innocent i defended her against daisy and my wife defended her also we tried to believe that she had no ill intention and see see what comes of it she steals the stiletto and kills the child in the most brutal manner i swear to hunt her down i swear the rector caught down the uplifted hand which morley was raising to the heavens be yourself he said sternly there is no need for a man to call upon god to witness a bloodthirsty oath if the woman is guilty let her be punished but give her the benefit of the doubt appearances are against her i admit all the same she may be able to prove her innocence you might as well talk to the wind as to me she is a murderess i'll do my best to have her hanged morley spoke with such vehemence that drake looked closely at him he wondered if the man had any grudge against anne denham that he spoke of her with such bitterness certainly her crime was a terrible one and she deserved to be condemned but it would only be fair that she should be first tried morley on the contrary had already judged her without waiting to hear what she had to say in her own favour well mr morley there is nothing more to be said he remarked coldly for he disliked this melodrama we must wait till the police come in the morning meanwhile i shall go to my home and get some sleep i can't sleep with that in the house replied morley abruptly rising i'll go with you where to the churchyard to the grave i intend to look for the weapon it may have been left there tossed aside by the assassin after the crime but the night is dark the snow is falling you will not be able to do anything be advised and no i'll come with you now if i find nothing it is all the better for her if i do he shook his hand again fiercely drake argued no longer seeing that the man's brain was in such a state that it was best to humour him they went out together but at the church gate drake excused himself and retired to his home he had no wish to see morley groping amongst the graves like a ghost pausing until the little man disappeared into the gloom the rector went to his house wondering at the sudden change in morley's character he had been a light-hearted and rather frivolous creature fond of gaiety and overflowing with the milk of human kindness now he was fierce and savage enough for a caliban he must have loved that poor girl very dearly sighed drake but i can't believe that such a charming woman as miss denham committed so cruel a crime there is some mystery about this and in this last speech he was right there was a mystery about the death and a much deeper one than a shallow man like the rector could fathom all through the long night mrs morley watched by the dead she had placed candles on either side of the bed and laid a cross on the poor child's breast drake was quite shocked when he saw this papistical arrangement but it afterwards came out that mrs morley had been educated in a convent and had imbibed certain notions of the romish ritual for the dead that her memory reviving made her act thus in spite of her openly confessed belief in the communion of the english church while she was thus sitting and weeping morley looked in he was wild and haggard but in his eyes glared a triumphant expression which terrified his wife she did not dare to move he crossed the room and looked at the body you shall be avenged my dear he said solemnly and before mrs morley could recover from her surprise and denounce this ill-chosen moment for a visit he wheeled round and disappeared he did not retire either no more did the servants who were collected in the kitchen steadying their nerves with tea so it happened that when giles weary wet and worn rode up to the door in the morning on a jaded beast he was met by morley have you caught her asked the man giles dismounted and threw the reins to a groom no trim went one way and i another where he is i don't know but my horse gave in and i returned he entered the house where is the body he asked up in the room it occupied during life said morley but come into the library i have something to show you ware followed and sank wearily into a chair he could scarcely keep his eyes open nevertheless he started up wide awake when his host spoke miss denham killed daisy said morley she took a stiletto from the wall yonder and here it is 
he produced it with a dramatic wave where did you find it beside the grave on the spot of the murder end of chapter five read by celine major chapter six of a coin of edward the seventh this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a coin of edward the seventh by fergus hume chapter six the case against anne the contradictory qualities of mrs perry's nature came out strongly in connection with the rickwell tragedy when miss denham was prosperous the old woman had nothing but bad to say of her now that she was a fugitive and generally credited with a crime mrs perry stood up for her stoutly she made herself acquainted with all details and delivered her verdict to mrs morley on whom she called for the express purpose of giving her opinion i never liked the woman she said impressively she was artful and frivolous and to gain admiration behaved in a brazen way of which i thoroughly disapproved all the same i do not believe she killed the girl but the evidence is strongly against her expostulated mrs morley and how many people have been hanged on evidence which has afterwards been proved incorrect retorted mrs perry i don't care how certain they are of her guilt in my opinion she is an innocent woman i am glad she has escaped i am not sorry myself sighed the other i was fond of anne for she had many good points but mr steele says who is mr steele the detective who has charge of the case i thought the police from chelmsford had it in hand of course mr morley sent for the police the morning after poor daisy's death that is three days ago to-morrow the inquest is to be held i suppose they will bring a verdict against poor miss denham ha said mrs perry rubbing her nose and my green grocer is on the jury much he knows about the matter but this steel creature where does he come from mr morley sent to london for him he has a private inquiry office i believe no such thing contradicted mrs perry he is from scotland yard a genuine detective none of your makeshifts i thought you knew nothing about him nor did i till this minute but i now remember seeing his name in connection with the theft of lady summerdale's diamonds he caught the thief in a very clever way steele martin steele i remember now so he has the case in hand humph he won't accuse anne denham you may be sure of that he's too clever but he is convinced of her guilt said the other triumphantly then the man's a fool i'll see him myself mrs perry did so the very next day after the inquest had been held and the verdict given she possessed a small neat cottage on the outskirts of rickwell standing some distance back from the high road seated at her drawing-room window she could see all those who came or went and thus kept a watch over the morals of the village this window was called mrs perry's eye and every one sneaked past it in constant dread of the terrible old lady who looked through it beyond mrs perry's cottage were the houses of the gentry and the church therefore she knew that steele would pass her house on the way to the elms where he would doubtless go to report himself to morley to be sure morley was to be at the inquest but mrs perry took no account of that he and the detective would certainly return to the elms to compare notes also there was another chance steele might go on to see where at his place which was a mile beyond the village giles had caught a cold after his midnight ride in search for the missing motor and since then had been confined to his bed his deposition had been taken down in writing for the benefit of the jury as he could not be present himself since he was deeply interested in the matter steele would probably go and tell him about the inquest mrs perry therefore posted herself at the window about twelve and waited for the detective at half-past twelve she saw him come along having on the previous day made herself acquainted with his personality he was a dapper pert little man neat in his dress and suave in his manners not at all like the detective of fiction as known to mrs perry there was no solemnity or hint of mystery about mr steele 
he would pass unnoticed in a crowd and no one would take him for a bloodhound of the law he did not even possess the indispensable eagle eye nor did he utter opinions with the air of an oracle in fact when mrs perry captured him and lured him into her parlour she was exceedingly disappointed with his appearance no one would even take you for a detective said she brusquely whereat steele laughed cheerily all the better for me ma'am folks speak more freely when they don't know my business but you will excuse me he added glancing at his watch i am in a hurry you say you know something about this matter it was on this pretence that mrs perry had got him into her house else he would not have wasted his time on her she had therefore to make good her words but had not the slightest chance of doing so i know that anne denham is innocent was all she could say but said it with the air of one who settles a difficult matter once and for all on what grounds ma'am on no grounds save those of my own common sense you have no evidence to i have the evidence of my own eyes you haven't seen the woman i have she is not the kind of person who would act so the jury take a different view said steele dryly they have brought in a verdict of wilful murder against her fools but what can you expect from a parcel of tradesmen i wish to hear on what grounds they made such idiots of themselves steele was somewhat taken aback by this coolness you must really excuse me said he rising but i have to see mr ware all in good time steele said the old lady coolly you might do worse than spend an hour with me there is precious little going on in this parish i don't know of i might be able to help you in your search after this woman steele shook his head i don't think so i expect she has escaped to foreign parts oh i know all about that i made trim tell me you know trim of course he was a groom once isn't he a groom now well mrs perry rubbed her nose you might call him an engineer when ware started a motor-car trim refused to let any one else attend to his young master but himself he was the servant of old ware and thinks it is his duty to look after the son not but what it's needed added mrs perry spitefully but trim learned how to work the car and so he is what you might call an engineer all very interesting ma'am but i have an appointment it will keep replied mrs perry suavely you had better wait still i have something to show you in connection with the case in connection with miss denham what is it show it to me all in good time steel i must first know what you think of the matter i think that this woman is guilty oh you do do you humph and i thought you clever how easily one can be deceived however you can sit down and tell me your grounds for this preposterous belief steele hesitated in all his career and it had been a varied one he had never met before with any one like this determined old dame she took possession of him in the calmest way and was evidently bent upon pumping him dry before he left the house as a rule steele was not a man to be pumped but after some reflection he concluded that it was just as well to use a sprat to catch a mackerel in plain english he determined with reservations to gratify mrs perry's curiosity so that he might get a sight of what she had to show him if he were reticent she would show him nothing whereas if he told her all about the evidence at the inquest and that was public property she would certainly open her mind to him moreover steele knew the value of having a gossip like mrs perry to aid him in gaining knowledge of the neighbourhood finally he saw that she was a shrewd matter-of-fact old person and for the sake of making his work easy it would be as well to conciliate her he therefore sat down with a cheerful air and prepared himself for an interesting conversation i shall be perfectly candid with you said he taking out his notes these are the memoranda i made at the inquest hum you have a bad memory i see i said mrs perry with emphasis i carry all i know in my head go on steele detailed the facts of the case he related the threat of anne against daisy overheard by mrs morley read out a copy of the anonymous letter 
emphasized the presence of anne in the library for the few minutes morley was absent when she would have had time to secure the stiletto and explained how morley had found the very weapon near the scene of the crime then he continued to relate what took place in church during the midnight service martha james said he was sitting not far from miss kent the corner was rather dark the whole church is badly lighted interrupted mrs perry i never could bear smelly kerosene lamps the corner was dark resumed steele patiently and martha as she says having a headache was rather inattentive to the sermon she saw a man near the door a tall man with a great coat and a white scarf she couldn't see his face plainly he slipped along the wall during the sermon when the attention of every one was fixed on the preacher and as martha saw slipped a scrap of paper into the hand of miss kent she started and bending towards a near lamp read the paper did any one else see her read it no she placed the paper in her prayer-book and so contrived to read it without exciting suspicion martha saw the action because she was well placed for observation and couldn't mind her own business i know martha james go on after a few minutes miss kent seemed to grow faint and slipped out of the church another witness samuel gibbs says that as she brushed past him she murmured that she felt unwell however she went out and the tall man also no he remained for another ten minutes martha james watched him because she could not think why he did not follow miss kent after giving her the paper of course martha thought of something bad sniffed mrs perry no doubt she believed that the two had arranged to meet so the tall man went out ten minutes afterwards what about anne she was a few pews behind and apparently inattentive but a small girl called sissy jinks a most precocious child interpolated the lady she is smart admitted steele well she declares that miss denham was watching the tall man all the time whether she saw him give the paper to miss kent no one seems to know i think myself she must have done so if she was as watchful as sissy jinks declares moreover she followed the tall man when he went out immediately five minutes afterwards ha then it was a quarter of an hour before she followed daisy hum didn't trim see them come out of the church the groom no he was at the lich gate with the car and the snow was falling fast besides the night was so dark that he could see nothing the first intimation he had of miss denham was when she came through the lich gate to tell him that his master was with miss kent on the way to the elms and wished to see him trim followed and left her in charge of the car when he was gone she went off leaving the body of the girl behind her the case is dead against her as you make it out it certainly is said mrs perry scathingly but what about the tall man what became of him he has vanished and no one seems to know anything about him ha said the old lady with satisfaction well i can enlighten you on that point he was the man who called to see mr morley and who left just before anne entered the library are you sure morley said nothing about that morley can hold his tongue when necessary said the old lady dryly yes that was the man the footman at the elms told me that mr morley's visitor wore a great coat and a white scarf the same dress murmured steele and the man was afterwards in church he passed a note and went out apparently to see miss kent i must question mr morley about him i wonder if he went away in the motor also of course he did replied mrs perry calmly anne was watching him according to sissy jinks and she followed him five minutes later it would seem that she knew him and after he killed daisy helped him to escape what do you say asked steele wrinkling his brows that this man killed miss kent the evidence is nearly as strong against him as against anne he was in the library also and might have obtained the stiletto it was he who lured daisy out of the church he was five minutes absent before anne followed quite long enough for him to kill the poor girl it sounds feasible i admit said the detective thoughtfully but even if this is true it incriminates miss anne she helped him to escape according to your theory 
she must therefore have known about the murder and that makes her an accessory after the fact in any case she should be arrested but not hanged insisted mrs parry i am sure she did not kill the girl as for the man she had a strong reason to get him out of the way but that does not say she knew of the crime i don't see what other reason she could have had said steele i dare say you are right and that this stranger did go with miss denham on the car what a pity no one saw them did no one see the car no it was found overturned in a hedge near tilbury i know said mrs parry not liking to have her omniscience questioned trim told me he came on the car by chance it was quite cold the furnace was extinguished it must have been abandoned for some time when he came across it i wonder where the pair went then you seem certain that the stranger was with miss denham yes i am quite satisfied on that point tilbury ha huh. they were making for tilbury did you inquire there steele nodded i could find no trace of them no one saw them or rather her for i asked only after miss denham it is my opinion that they must have got on board some ship and have escaped to foreign parts i could not learn of any ship having left that night though well that is all the evidence mrs parry and you can see for yourself that the case against miss denham is almost conclusive all the same i believe she is innocent insisted the old lady it was the man who committed the crime ask morley about him do you think he knows anything not of the murder but he must know the man's name and now as you have been so frank with me i'll show you what i promised do you remember the anonymous letter and the reference to the scarlet cross yes miss denham said that her father who is now dead wore a red enamelled cross on his watch-chain i know mrs morley told me so now see here mrs parry opened her left hand which for some time she had kept clenched in her palm lay a small gold cross enamelled red where did you get that asked steele astounded mrs bates the pew opener found it in the church and brought it to me it was found near the spot where the stranger stood what steele started to his feet ah you are beginning to see now said the old lady yes steele you may well look and is innocent on the evidence of this cross i believe that her father is not dead he was the stranger he killed daisy and because he was her father and aided him to escape End of chapter six read by celine majeure